Good evening, everyone. It's really nice to see all of you here. Um, and I'm delighted to be here at Loyola Marymount University. Uh, I, I know the university well. Uh, my uh, esteemed uh, uh, successor and very good friend, uh, Ambassador Sung Kim, now U.S. Ambassador in Seoul, of course, is alumni. And uh, I also know of LMU through its uh, association over the years with a great, great university in Seoul, uh, Sogong University, uh, which, by the way, is the, uh, uh, the university from which the current president, uh, 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 Park Geun-hye, uh, graduated. So uh, I think this is a, a, the perfect forum uh, for talking about uh, ties between the United States and Korea, uh, where we've been, where we're going. I'm going to try, really try hard, not to talk for too long. One, I, I, I know and I, I thank so much the hearty students who are here. I know this is probably one of the worst weeks of your lives, right, <laughs> so far? Uh, or maybe not, but finals are coming up next week. Uh, but I really, really appreciate uh, your taking time out of what I know is a very, very stressful time to come and join us tonight. And I hope you'll join in a conversation with this really very distinguished group uh, we have from uh, throughout uh, uh, Southern California who have their own deep uh, experience and ties in uh, U.S.-Korean relations. So I will try very hard to make this a discussion because, you know, um, I don't work for the U.S. government anymore. Um, I finished my uh, 35 years as a Foreign Service officer uh, last year. So while I'm certainly happy to do my best to uh, uh, describe to you my understanding of U.S. policy and U.S. aims uh, in, in the world and especially in the Pacific and in Korea, um, I, I don't speak for it anymore, so I don't have to sort of march out a bunch of policy points. Uh, and secondly, I'm very mindful, though, that right now I'm at Stanford University for the year, and I just taught a course called Issues in U.S.-Korean Relations, and it took a whole quarter, and we didn't get through half of it. So I'm not going to try to cram all that in tonight either. Instead, I thought I'd do sort of two things. One is I thought I would try to talk a little bit about what I call Korea's modern journey. And it's a journey that also is a little bit of the story of my life, if you don't mind by being a little bit personal about that. And the reason I thought I would do that is because one of the things that's really impressed me about the Center for Asian Business and the way it was set up is that as I read the material, talked to your professors and some, and, uh, some of the students here, um, the, 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 the program is, is about the notion that if you're going to be a successful uh, a business person in today's uh, world where the Pacific ties, the, the Asian uh, business ties are so strong, you need to go beyond just the technicalities of knowing your business. You need to know something about the culture, the language, about building relationships, about the history, about all those things that establish the relationships on which diplomacy is built, on which business is built, on which hopefully peace and also profits are also built. So I think in that context, I, I thought maybe it'd be interesting to talk with you a little bit, particularly for the students, uh, about um, what it was like to be a diplomat in Korea and other places over the years and, uh, and to be both a witness uh, and in some ways a very small participant in what I think is one of the most extraordinary stories of the 20th century and now the 21st century, and that is uh, uh, the Korean people's journey to, uh, uh, to build a, a modern, successful uh, society in the Republic of Korea and the continuing challenges on the Korean Peninsula vis-a-vis -vis North Korea and also, also in the region. Um, but first of all, I, I do have a confession to make. Um, I have been out of touch for a while, for the last few weeks. I haven't spent a lot of time preparing this lecture. In fact, I want to tell you that I've been off the grid for three weeks. I, uh, I just returned on, on Saturday from 21 days uh, rafting uh, in the Grand Canyon, uh, 300 canyon miles. And, you know, I, I do this actually once a decade. <laughs> so this is my fourth time. And this time I was more aware than ever of how seldom we actually go, I, I, maybe there's another expression you all use for it, but off the grid, right? What's, uh, what's the longest time any of you have been away from some sort of modern uh, communication device uh, uh, over the last uh, six months? Anybody? Do I hear one day? Yeah. A weekend, three days? How was that? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anybody can beat that? Okay. Yeah? How long? Four days. Okay. I hear four days. Okay. 
well, I'm going to declare that I'm the winner because I was off the grid for 21 days. And I also didn't take a shower or, you know, <laughs> or go inside, but that's another story. And I have cleaned up a little bit. But OK, why do I mention this? First of all, so going down the Grand Canyon, I was with a group of 16 people. And they all wanted to talk about Korea. And these were not people who had anything to do with Korea, none of them. Uh, th there were British, bus British business people, some journalists, uh, some outdoors people, from, from uh, some family members from Montana and Idaho. But they were interested. What's going on? So we actually had a couple of nights literally under the stars when we talked about Korea. Uh, but while we were doing that, and while we were taking this trip down the Grand Canyon, you know, when you go through the Grand Canyon from, from the, down the river, you go through you know, layers of time, right? It's a, it's a great geology lesson. And you see over time, over billions of years, layers of the Earth's history. And, um, but there's one point that you get to. Why am I talking about this? A geology lesson. But there's one point that you get to about 200 miles on the river into the trip when suddenly everything changes. And there's a, all you see around you is the evidence of a volcanic eruption that happened very, very recently. And so suddenly you're in a different place. And very, very recently in geological time is like hundreds of thousands of years. But this is a very, very new event. But if you're just there, you think, that's it. That's the Grand Canyon. It's the volcanic event because that's all you see. I thought about Korea. Why did I think about Korea? My point here is, sometimes uh, as someone who has an experience in Korea, when I tell people, yes, I lived, I worked in Korea, they say, oh, South Korea or North Korea, right? Um, <laughs> no, they do. They do. And I, I, I'm wherever they're from, very well-informed people in many ways. Um, and my point is, the division of Korea now is how old? Almost 70 years, right? Korea was divided in 1945 when a line was drawn across by a couple of American colonels with the intent that it was going to be a temporary line to uh, facilitate the surrender of Japanese troops. We're not going to go into the whole history, but of course, uh, uh, to the great tragic result of millions of divided families and a terrible, terrible war, uh, we not only saw the, the, the consolidation of the division of Korea with an armistice in 1953, but the continued division uh, and lack of reconciliation today. So we've had a divided Korea now for a couple of generations. My point I want to make and is, if you think of that sort of in terms of looking at that volcanic structure in the Grand Canyon, this is like what we're looking at now, but it's not what Korea is. When we're talking about Korea, we're talking about the Korean Peninsula. We're talking about a country that for centuries, almost unparalleled in the world, has been a unified, homogeneous people, culture, and society. And I think that's why it's appropriate and important that President Park Geun-hye now talk about reunification as something that must be kept in mind as not just a faraway dream or something that used to happen, but as something that's very real and a very urgent task. Because what we're seeing now is, I would say in historical terms, an anomaly, the division of Korea and certainly the alienation of the two countries and the continuing tragedy of the difficult lives of the people of North Korea. Anyway, that may be a little bit of a strained analogy, but that's what I was thinking about when I was off the grid for three weeks, among other things. So I came back on Saturday and uh, opened up my, uh, my very, very large Samsung phone for people who are losing their sight and started reading through all the emails. And of course, I was interested in many things. What had happened in the world in three weeks? Um, well, what had happened in Korea? Yes. Yes. First of all, this terrible, terrible tragedy. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sinking of this um, uh, ferry with so many precious young lives on it. And I, you know, even from this distance, I think we can all feel, and I certainly feel it as, as, as a parent, uh, the pain of certainly those families and of the whole Korean nation and of all of us to think of all these precious, precious lives. So needlessly and tragically lost. So I'm heartsick about that. And I just felt I should say something about that in terms of thinking of those families. And also thinking, as I look at what's happening in Korea now, that um, in not forgetting that loss, I, I do have hope and confidence that, that the Korean people will draw something positive from this, that as they have done out of great tragedy in the past, that they will find a way to address um, some, of the, some of the issues and shortcomings that uh, uh, created this, uh, this, this, this terrible, terrible disaster. So that was one thing, and I, I think I, I know you all joined me in, 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 in sending out our thoughts and our prayers to all who are 
mourning for this terrible loss. And another thing, as I came out, that I was reading about uh, on my, uh, my, my phone, uh, President Obama went to Korea, right? How many times has President Obama been to Korea? Does anybody know? Four times, four times. Uh, I was in Korea as ambassador the first two times he visited, and, uh, and actually uh, the first time he came was the first time he'd ever been to Korea. Uh, and uh, it was really interesting to see how he was, he came with a great interest in Korea for a number of reasons. One, it's a very important country, and I'm going to get into some of the issues, the free trade agreement, our work together on North Korea. But he also came because he had um, an interest in, again, the Korean story. From his days in Chicago, where he had seen uh, the uh, uh, Korean community's uh, uh, aspirations for education and better life for their children. And in fact, one of the most memorable times, and actually much reported on when he was in Korea that first time, was, I'm, you can see I'm digressing, this is why I get long, but I have to tell you this story, was he actually said to the then president, Im Young Bak, after they, they had gone through the, the kind of formal agenda of again, North Korea, free trade agreement, he said, you know, President Lee, I don't usually have a chance when I'm traveling abroad this is into the, to ask other foreign leaders about how they handle certain issues in their own countries, but he said, I want to ask you about education in Korea, you know, because everyone admires the Korean passion for education, and, and you know, I'm really looking to, to try to kind of uh, uh, improve the American educational system. He said, but what's the, what's the biggest problem you face in, uh, in Korean education? And, uh, and President Lee said, the parents. <laughs> The parents, they're too demanding. And you know what President Obama, he said, we want more of that. We want more of that. Uh, we want more of that passion for education. And that's a dialogue that actually has continued uh, as he has returned to Korea time and again and as he has hosted uh, uh, first President Lee and then President Park last year to the United States. But in any event, this is his fourth trip. I don't think there's another country, someone can fact check it, uh, that President Obama has actually visited more than Korea. Uh, some of this has to do with, the, with Korea's global role. He went there for the G20 uh, uh, meeting of uh, major economies uh, uh, several years ago and then for the Nuclear Security Summit. So a sign that Korea is a, is a venue because it leads on many of these global issues. Uh, but, uh, but he also went because he, he, he wanted to affirm that, as he has put it, the U.S.-Korea relationship is in the best shape ever. So that was the second thing. So President Obama is kind of looking at that. We can talk about that a little bit more later. And then, of course, the third thing was, what's always in the news? North Korea. North Korea. And, of course, I came back. You know how when you come back, even after three days, or you kind of see, sometimes it's even overnight, if you're really following politics, you know, moment by moment, it's, oh, looks like North Korea is going to test a nuclear de device. Maybe, maybe, maybe. No, they didn't, you know, until next time. So, so this whole sort of uh, sense of, of, you know, North Korea uh, still moving more towards uh, uh, actions that will bring it greater isolation than back into uh, some kind of dialogue that could lead to a different future. And again, we'll get back to that. So, so I was reminded again, um, uh, as I thought about those things, just from that three weeks away and catching up, that uh, the two Koreas have been on very, very different paths, very different journeys uh, over the last uh, 70 years. I have a friend who's, uh, I'm moving from ge geolo geology to social science for a minute. I have a friend uh, who's a social scientist. Any of you studying social science here? Probably a lot of you, yeah. Um, and he said this, he said, he said, you know, just setting aside just for the moment the, the humanitarian element and tragedy of the, of the division of the Korean Peninsula, you could also actually look at that line drawn across Korea as the largest long-term real-life social science experiment ever conducted. You take, as I was saying earlier, a country with an exceptionally, maybe even uniquely long and united history as one unit, exceptionally homogeneous in terms of ethnicity, language, and culture, you draw a line across it. And on each side, you pursue re radically different policies, with the South embarking on a journey, yes, a very bumpy one at times, uh, of increasing economic opportunity and democratic freedoms. And the North, a very different path. The North, where until the 1960s, its centralized command economy industrialized faster and developed faster than the South, but then became increasingly unable to feed even its own people and turned its scarce resources to further militarization, including, of course, a nuclear weapons program and a missile program. And the result, in human terms, of course, has been not just the tragedy of division itself, but the disaster for the long-suffering people of North Korea. 
Back to North Korea, I know a little bit later we'll have a discussion of it. But now I want to turn to South Korea's extraordinary journey, because I actually think it's not enough understood or appreciated. And it's something that's very close to my heart. And there are, as I said, many people here tonight, other than me, who are also witnesses and important participants in parts of this journey. So as, tell me, tell you a little bit more about myself. I mean, as, as, as Dr. Peck said, um, I first went to Korea probably about the age of some of you in this room. I was uh, 21 years old. I had just graduated from university. And uh, I joined the Peace Corps. Uh, and by the way, I, I still recommend the Peace Corps as a wonderful way to get experience that can lay the groundwork for a business career, for a diplomatic career, for uh, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, futures. And, and besides, it's a great thing to do. But I went to Korea, and I, that was in 1975. And I, I had spent uh, 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 study abroad time in Hong Kong. I kind of thought, you know, I knew something about Asia. Nothing prepared me, honestly, for what I found in Korea in 1975. And not because it was terribly, you know, awful. It was, but it was a place that was uh, a very challenging place to live. I lived in the countryside. Uh, I, I'm, I'm you, you, a lot of Californians in this room. I grew up in Arizona. I'd never lived through a winter, and suddenly I was living in a place that had a winter and no heat. And I was teaching in a classroom that had 70 little boys and no heat. You know, we'd wear gloves on our hands. I mean, some of you remember this, and uh, where there's again no hot water. I'm into hot water these days. Uh, but even more than that, um, uh, life was just very tough for people. But with all that, there was this tremendous sense of something was happening. I mean, certainly Korea was starting to industrialize, but in the countryside too, life was changing for people. And then, even as now, there was this tremendous aspiration for education, for people who'd been through the Korean War to create a different life uh, for their children. And they worked hard to do it. Uh, I think sometimes when uh, we Americans, we join the Peace Corps, we think, oh, we're going to go off someplace and we'll show people how to really work hard. You know, <laughs> I, was, I was the lazy one. You know, I was the one who uh, at like 8 o'clock at night at the school, I was saying, I really want to go home now. <laughs> but nobody else was going home. Uh, so I learned some lessons too, which was my other comment about Peace Corps. You learn more than you teach. You get more than you give. And that was certainly true uh, in my case. But I feel like I was really in Korea to see the ground floor of the economic transformation that has made Korea the economic powerhouse that it is today. Um, politics uh, was another matter. Uh, uh, Dr. Peck and I were talking about this. I mean, if you were in university at that time, as, as, as you were, classes weren't held too much because there were so many demonstrations that there would be if the students got together. Uh, for me, I, uh, as, as a foreigner there, I just know that I didn't like it when I buy my Time magazine and it had been censored. <laughs> Uh, because uh, uh, freedom of, of the press uh, was something that was still in very short supply in Korea. But I'll tell you another way before I, about, uh, about how Korea affected me then, and that is it really set me on the path to join the Foreign Service, to join the American Diplomatic Corps. And here's my little commercial now for, uh, for American diplomacy or joining it. I'm looking at the students uh, 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 back here, well, although any of you, you know, might want to think about it. Um, you take an exam, and it actually doesn't cost anything to take the exam. You know, it's not like the SAT or something. And, um, and at that time, the exam is different now. You take it online. But at that time, back, way back in 1976, uh, the exam was given once a year. And it was given once a year at universities around the United States and at US embassies overseas. And uh, you know, I kind of heard about it, and I'd seen the embassy. And uh, so uh, I decided uh, uh, I would take the exam. And this turned out to be a really, really culturally great thing to do. Because everyone understood in Korea if you were studying for an exam. It kind of gave your life you know, extra weight and meaning. And, um, and I'll always remember when I, uh, for all those long, long hours that I was sitting with the uh, teachers in the uh, teacher's room, uh, but I always remember when I was just beginning to learn Korean, and I had to um, ask permission to, to, to miss school. We had school on Saturdays then. The exam was on a Saturday to, uh, to go up to Seoul to take the exam. And so I practiced my Korean, and I walked up. This is a really long room and, uh, where all the teachers sit. And because I was young and female, I was at the very other end of the room, the farthest from the stove. And I had to walk up and, uh, uh, and say to Mr. Vice Principal, this is in Korean, I am going to take the diplomatic exam. May I miss school and go to Seoul to take it on Saturday? And I always remember what he said to me. He said, uh, in a very, he said, are you going to pass it? <laughs> <laughs> he said, if you're going to pass it, you can go. <laughs> so that was my lesson about Korean culture, I guess, in some ways. 
Uh, but it was also very inspiring to me, because of course I said in a very uh, Korean fashion, I'll try my best. <laughs> But in any event, that was a transformation in my life. Uh, I, I did join the Foreign Service, but more importantly, I saw what I would call Korea's first act of its modern transformation, and that was economically, it was on its way. That was clear. Politically, much less clear. And when I left Korea, it was still under essentially martial law. And two years after I left, of course, the president was assassinated, and there was another period of great uh, political turmoil. So I went back to Korea. I joined, I joined the Foreign Service. Um, I, uh, I had a posting in, in China. I was two years in Guangzhou as uh, uh, that place was opening up in an extraordinary way. I'd be happy to talk some more about that. This is way back in 1980. And then I went back to Korea, 1983, and I ended up staying in Korea for six years. Here's another lesson. If you, learn, uh, if you, if you get bitten by a bug like the Korean language, I mean this in a good way, or Korea, you can end up spending a lot of time there. You know, there, was, there And so I studied Korean. I went as a political officer, and I was covering internal politics in Korea. This was a totally different Korea for me. This was not the Korea in the countryside where everybody was you know, working hard to get their kids to go to school and nobody talked about politics. This was a Korea in Seoul and in the cities where the students were angry. The students were angry. And a lot of people were angry but not showing it because they felt that uh, 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 Korea was not moving towards democracy uh, uh, as it should. Uh, the, a, after the assassination of Park Geun-hye in 1979, of course, there was another military coup d'etat and uh, a terrible loss of life in Gwangju. The U.S. was uh, blamed by many people for not doing enough uh, to stop that. So I, I, I had to deal with a new Korea where people blamed the United States for not playing its proper role in democratization. I had to deal with the U.S.-Korea relationship where um, we talked to the Korean government about things like torture and human rights because they were both big issues uh, in Korea in the 1980s. Um, it was a Korea where Seoul and Korea was getting ready to host the Olympics in 1988 and becoming concerned about what the political situation would be as the Olympics came. But to summarize all that, I'd love to talk more about it. I'm going to write a little book about it someday, I, I, I promise, because it was one of the most inspiring years, uh, experiences of my life. Um, the people of Korea, first from the students, but then broadening out into working with politicians in a variety of, of, of parties, if you like, and then the broader and growing middle class, the parents of the students who said, you know what, if we've gone from having a per capita income in a decade of $500 to $2,000, if we're ready to host the Olympics in 1988, um, if our lives are improving so much, we should, we're, we're mature enough, we're ready to elect the president with our own hands. And that's what their slogan was, is we want to vote for president. We don't want to have some indirect system where the kind of pre-cooked candidate gets it. And people went out on the streets and that's what they demonstrated for. Now in other countries they demonstrate for other things and elections alone don't make a perfect democracy as we all know. But that was the turning point because they went out that's what they wanted, and they said, we, we don't want to see our students uh, uh, locked up. We don't want to see them beaten and tortured and killed by tear gas canisters. And the government, and those, some of the facts, heard them and agreed to an election. And in, in a space of three months, I went from, uh, uh, as a young officer covering these things, uh, much as journalists do, from being tear gassed every day when I went out to these demonstrations to going to political rallies that had a million people, a million people gathering to hear peacefully what the candidates had to say. And Korea has never looked back from that. Certainly, like any democracy, including ours in this country, it's a, it's a democracy with a lot of warts, and you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of co uh, Koreans complain about it. But it is a democracy that's never looked back. And every five years, the pendulum has swung again as another party or another, certainly another president has peacefully come into power. And the military is doing what it needs to do, which is to protect the country and keep it safe. It is a great, great achievement. And I believe it's a continuing inspiration to me and an inspiration, I believe, to the rest of the world. But it was also a time back in the 80s when I was going to talk a little bit about trade, when there were a lot of trade disputes. And that was a big part of the US-Korea relationship, too. So it was a bit of a rocky time. Then in the 1990s, of course, Korea almost went bankrupt. It wasn't, and, uh, but they made the reforms to come back. And in some ways, what they did in the so-called IMF crisis, for those of you who've heard about 1998, I think really prepared South Korea for what came in 2008, which uh, was, of course, the, the global financial crisis. Um, and that brings me, I guess, to my going back again. I went back in 2008 as US ambassador. Uh, 
I think a lot of people were kind of shocked by that. And again, if I may say it as a side note, uh, uh, for those of you, and especially for young women out there who may think, wow, I don't think the world is changing fast enough. When I was assigned as a young officer in 1983 to go to Korea as a political officer, the, I, I can say this now, the ambassador uh, at that time in Korea said, I, I, there had never been a woman in the political section said, a woman cannot come to Korea as a political officer because Koreans can't deal with that. <laughs> um, I think it was really he who couldn't deal with it because he'd never, he'd never had a woman work for him in that capacity before. But because institutionally the State Department has changed enough, they said, we're sorry, you may feel that way, and even though you're ambassador, you know, there's nothing we can do about it, you have to take her. He had to take me. It did work out pretty well because I think because I, I did learn Korean, because I did reach out to people, because I, you know, because I could do the job too. And I think I gave a range, as we've seen now, as we've had Korean Americans too, who by the way weren't in the embassy at that time, a greater range in depth to what the embassy did. Um, it worked out really well, and I hope it, it helped to make it a little easier for those who followed. So to me, you can imagine it was very sweet to think in 2008, no one said, I don't think a woman can be um, uh, ambassador to Korea. At least they didn't say it to me. <laughs> and, um, and I have to say, uh, I, uh, uh, it, was, it was the best job of my life. And I do like to remind, again, my American friends now that whatever, we could have a long discussion about gender roles and all the changes in Korea still going on. But by the way, they've elected a woman president, and we haven't yet. <laughs> so, um, so we have to be careful to jump to, to jump to conclusions, to jump to judgment about, about how other countries deal with some of the issues that we also, we also grapple with. But back to then, 2008, I, said, I arrived just as actually the day that Lehman Brothers collapsed. I began to think that maybe I'm going to be really dealing here in Korea with, uh, uh, starting in 2008 with, uh, with the financial crisis throughout. Korea rebounded pretty quickly from it, which is not to say it wasn't serious. And Korea also, uh, as part of that, played a leadership role. I, I mentioned the G20 and, and, and the first summit of the G20 leaders, you know, the G20, the, the 20 largest economies in the world, a little bit larger than G, G7 was led uh, by Korea. But this is a confident Korea, a global Korea sometimes called, creative, uh, a Korea that when I had first gone to Korea, obviously was receiving Peace Corps volunteers, now has its own, its own essentially Peace Corps volunteer program, COICA volunteers who go abroad, deepening relations with China and a huge trade relationship, really taking its place in the world. Now what about the US-Korea relations specifically? I wanted to say a word about, I think one of the important things, and I'm not taking credit for, there were a lot of people who worked on this over the years, that happened, that I was part of uh, uh, while I was in Korea, and that was the work on the US-Korea free trade agreements, right? I mean, all of you have, have heard about that. As background to that, let me just say a word since a lot of business students here. One, South Korea made a decision um, pretty early on, um, probably about, yeah, 10 or 15 years ago, that to stay competitive uh, in the very competitive neighborhood it's in, especially with a rising China and with always competitive Japan, it needed to get out there and develop its markets and decided one of the ways to do that was through reforming its own economy, opening its own economy uh, with free trade agreements. And its, uh, it, its, its first free trade agreement was with Chile. That's the reason you can buy a lot of Ch Chilean wine still in Korea today. As it, it, it has a loyal following. Since Korea, and since then, uh, Korea has developed eight other free trade agreements with a total of 46 countries. Now, a lot of those countries are in the European Union. There's a, there's a Korea-European Union free trade agreement that pretty much mirrors the US-Korea US free trade agreement. So that's 46 countries that represent 62% of world GDP. So the Republic of Korea has really been on the cutting edge of, of this kind of bilateral uh, development of a bilateral free trade architecture. What, of course, is closest to our heart and, I, and, and is, is, is the Korea-US free trade agreement. This was negotiated and signed in 2007. That's a long time ago now. And it wasn't ratified until 2011 and then implemented in 2012. So we're still at just the beginning of, of, of implementing it. Now, why did it take so long? Just, just a word about that. Like, one, this is for the United States, the biggest free trade agreement we've done since NAFTA. So this is a big deal in the United States. And it was obviously a big deal for South Korea, too. And there were important domestic constituencies that had concerns in both countries about it. Two, when it was negotiated, it was actually negotiated in both countries under 
uh, uh, administrations that subsequently lost the election, right, their, their parties. So, so this was negotiated under President George W. Bush on the U.S. side and under President No Mo Hyun on the uh, South Korean side. And then the opposite parties in both countries took power and there was still this signed agreement that still had to go through our congressional process. It needed a ratification both in the U.S. Congress and in the Korean National Assembly. So I mention all this because this is an, kind of an important example of how sometimes democracies are great things, but they do complicate foreign policy sometimes. And there was naturally a period in both countries when the new governments kind of looked at the free trade agreement and tried to decide what to do with it. But I think in the end, to summarize, both you know, the Obama administration and the Im myung bak administration decided not to coin the phrase. This was too important to be set aside, too important to fail, not only for the U.S., South Korea trade relationship and overall relationship, but also for anchoring the United States in Asia, for anchoring uh, a series of, 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 of approaches and protocols to trade uh, in the Pacific region, uh, uh, particularly as, as the, the region continues to be transformed by uh, China's uh, enormous rise, which is not to say this is something that has to do with somehow against China, but it's, a, it's, it's an attempt to really set what does a modern free trade agreement look like? very, very strong environmental and, uh, and, and labor protections, uh, for example. Um, a lot of work on things like non-tariff barriers, right? I mean, tariff was kind of the old problem, but as we all know, those of you who study business, those of you who are in business, there's a lot of things that can stop you from trading that aren't even tariffs. They're the regulations. They're the processes that you have to go through. So it tried to address a lot of that. And the implementation now is still going on. Now, you'll hear some, some unhappiness. I've heard it from some quarters of uh, American business in the United States that, that so far, and again, implementation only began in 2012, uh, U.S. trade uh, to Korea, to South Korea, has not risen as much as South Korean trade to the United States has. Um, I would simply say I think it's early days. Um, the uh, overall trade has gone up. And in er in particularly in areas like services, uh, the uh, 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 insurance, law firms, some of these ser services where U.S. firms are very, very competitive, the free trade agreement has allowed American firms to do business in a, in a, in a, a, a fuller way in South Korea. Because, of course, it's important to remember, especially in today's economy, and especially when you talk about the American economy, some of what we're talking about is not you know, the traditional manufactured goods. It is, it is the trade in, 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 in services uh, where we are highly competitive and where uh, the U.S. Free Trade Agreement has established a very strong foundation. And the final point I would make about, about the Free Trade Agreement and the importance of it is, is I think this has really kind of laid the foundation for what is now a top priority of the Obama administration, and that is the TPP, right, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The major trade goal, I said I, I, I'm not speaking for the government anymore, but it doesn't mean I'm not interested. The, ma the major trade goal of, of the Obama administration uh, uh, in, the, in the coming year or so is to conclude a multilateral, right, many countries in the Pacific area, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Agreement, and to conclude a similar kind of agreement with the EU. This is very, very ambitious, and I don't envy the negotiators at all. But uh, I, it would not even be possible, I think, to be working towards this uh, absent uh, the example uh, and the success in, uh, in, in, in ratifying and implementing the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement. Um, two more things, and I really will stop. I wanted to make a couple of comments about just, you know, where was the U.S. in all this? I guess I've said a little bit about the Free Trade Agreement, but uh, what I've tried to describe to you a little bit is, is the story, the, the, South Korea's incredible modern journey, which is a great tribute, I think, to, to first and foremost, the character of the Korean people, their readiness to, uh, uh, to never give up, uh, to work in very unpromising circumstances for success, and some good policy. Uh, not always exactly right, but good policy. And what has the U.S. done on it? I think that you can say the U.S. has done a lot of things right in Korea, not everything, but I hope we've gotten the big things right especially an assistance program in the early years that emphasized education, that emphasized land reform. We've had troops in Korea since the end of the Korean War, uh, now about 28,000 that have continued to provide uh, uh, the shield and the, the security within which uh, South Korea has been able to uh, uh, accomplish uh, so much both economically and, uh, and politically. Our open market provided opportunities for Korean businesses 
Uh, that continues to be important, but in the early days, it was extremely important. And I would say that's also been in the case of China, where I think we can take a lot of satisfaction in knowing that uh, China's extraordinary uh, rise in development, which has brought hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, uh, has been I think, with the support of the United States, and particularly with our open markets and our, 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 our eagerness and readiness to, to welcome and embed China into the global trading system. And I would also add increasingly the Korean American community as it has grown in size, not only in size, uh, but also as citizens who, whether they're US citizens or, or, or maintain a Korean citizenship, have a deep and abiding interest in the relationship. As we see Korean students come to the US in ever increasing numbers, uh, uh, I've touched on education, so we're here a number of times, but you know, South Korea sends more students per capita to the United States than any other country. And when you think about an education crazy country like Korea, if parents are sending their, 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 their students to the United States, what a vote of confidence that is in the future of the US-Korea relationship. And we found we have common interests and sometimes synergies uh, and, and values throughout the world, whether it's in things like disaster relief or sustainable development. And I could give you a lot of examples. I was telling somebody earlier today but I, that uh, I actually went to Uzbekistan during my tenure as, uh, as American ambassador because uh, South Korea had an important relationship with Uzbekistan and some issues on which we could work closely together and there would be many, many more. So the U.S.-Korea relationship is stronger than ever and it needs to be because we have so many global challenges. Uh, sustainable jobs, and innovation, green growth, climate change, on which South Korea is a very important partner. Uh, we are natural partners on that. So you're finally going to say, well, what about North Korea? I mean, it's not, all this sounds really great, but uh, what about North Korea? And as I suggested, it's been uh, a frustrating and, and difficult path, uh, not only for the last few years, uh, but, uh, but for many more. I, you know, it's, it, it's a source of pain, I think, to all of us and a tragedy that the regime in North Korea has over the decades chosen a path that has brought such misery to its people and danger and instability to the region. I have to say, when I arrived in Korea in 2008, uh, we were at a point in this process called the six-party talks where we were still trying to implement an agreement that had been reached in 2005. And uh, it fell apart shortly thereafter, probably a lot of reasons for it, including uh, changes, uh, the, the, the leader in, uh, in North Korea becoming very ill and, of course, subsequently passing away. Uh, but in any event, uh, I think the greatest disappointment, if I had one of my tenure in Seoul, was that uh, instead of seeing some progress, uh, much needed progress towards a more normal relationship on the peninsula, towards lowered tensions, towards a, a, a North Korea that would move away from its path of, of spending its scarce resources on nuclear and missile development and more towards uh, uh, developing an economy that would uh, 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 allow the North Korean people to have better lives and, and, and exercise their potential. Uh, we had uh, uh, another nuclear test, uh, missile tests, and of course uh, two uh, attacks, uh, 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 sometimes called provocations, but two North Korean attacks on so uh, South Korean ship and on South Korean civilians. So it was a tough time that way, and it's been tough ever since. And I think it's been a disappointment, certainly, to put it lightly, to everyone involved in trying to find a better way forward uh, to be frustrated every turn. What have we learned from it? I think one thing that we've learned on the US side is that uh, Close, close, close cooperation with Seoul is absolutely essential. And also with China and with Japan. And this notion of the parties working together on this remains uh, uh, the way to go. That doesn't mean that the US doesn't have a very, very central role to play, but it does mean that Seoul, and I think President Park has spoken to this, um, is in a position to, to try to move forward in building uh, uh, some kind of opening to North Korea. But you know, we, we, have to, uh, uh, we have to see what the response is and, and respond accordingly. Basically, the sort of same, if you like, deal has been on the table for some time. And the deal really is uh, that North Korea, uh, and, and, and by the way, North Korea has signed up to this deal, at least in principle in 2005 and some earlier agreements, is that the Korean Peninsula becomes a place that is denuclearized. No, no nuclear weapons. There are no nuclear weapons in South Korea. We think there should be no nuclear weapons in North Korea. Uh, and with that denuclearization uh, would come, uh, as I mentioned earlier, 
significant uh, economic and energy assistance, which North Korea much needs uh, from the other countries in the, in, in the six parties, uh, would come a, uh, a move towards a, uh, a permanent uh, a peace process or a peace agreement to replace the armistice. Remember, this, the Korean Peninsula is still, the, the uneasy peace there is held by a ceasefire, essentially an armistice dating from 1953. Um, eventually uh, normalized relations with the United States uh, as, uh, as, as North Korea uh, moves towards uh, uh, fulfilling some of the obligations one expects, including in human rights from uh, any, any member of the international community in the uh, 21st century, and, uh, and a better relationship between North and South, and hopefully, gradually, reconciliation and indeed reunification. So it's a big agenda still before us. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to uh, uh, be too cheerful about the short-term prospects uh, for uh, progress in North Korea, but it takes persistence, and it takes uh, steadiness, and, uh, I, I, and it takes a very, very close relationship between Seoul and Washington, and I do believe uh, in that respect uh, we, are, we are perhaps in better shape than we've, perhaps than we've ever been in terms of that cooperation. So much to do uh, in the U.S.-Korea relationship. I feel it very much when I'm here in, in Los Angeles, where the, the center of gravity is that really has shifted towards the Pacific, where we understand that uh, the kinds of societies that we build, our, our, our ability to, uh, to address uh, uh, global problems, really is going to, to depend uh, in very large part on our ability to uh, work together with our partners, um, including the Republic of Korea, to solve the regional issues and the global issues uh, that confront us now. So I will stop there and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you.